This is kind of a last minute talk. Uh, well, I gave that talk technically two years ago. Uh, it was online, uh, but I, I, I offered to step in when I, I noticed that some people were, um, were not available. So hopefully everything goes well. Uh, I've updated it, of course, because two years has passed and technology has, has changed. Um, let's, let's talk about uh, where did this talk uh, start with, uh, start from. Uh, before I go there, how many of you are working games here, just so I get an idea? Oh, wow, some of you, cool. <clears throat> All right, take notes, I guess. Uh, this is technically not industrial espionage. So uh, this talk started because this is a recurring theme, like on every uh, like platform ever. This is the worst platform ever, by the way, is Steam. Never read Steam comments. Like, if you're a game developer, please ignore Steam comments. This is the worst. It doesn't matter what you do, they will hate you. Like, all forums are pretty nice. Uh, but yeah, this is one of the screenshots I could find. Like someone was asking, like, how do we use multi-threading in Paradox game? Like, is it even possible? Maybe there's like a software trick. So uh, I thought about it a lot, and I don't know how to best formulate the answer for for that person. And this is my my, my easiest uh, walkthrough to how to use threading in our in our game. So the easiest way is at level seven, you pick improved uh, software trick. Level 13, greater software trick. We were, I'm more like a 3.5 guy originally, so you know, it fits everywhere. There's a software trick, so prestige class in, a, in one of the supplements. You would need to consider it. And honestly, gnomes and cat folks have the best like synergy modifiers to, uh, to play with that. Okay, joking aside, like, why, why was this guy so upset about threads? Like, what did he mean? What was the, what was the question behind the question, basically? Uh, and if you look at, uh, at clock speeds in CPUs, uh, you want something interesting. Like we kind of uh, went all the way to the moon and then back, and then we kind of stagnated since. Uh, I remember buying a CPU at that time, uh, like the Extreme Edition, uh, whatever uh, Pentium Four. That was like at the time where we feel like clock speed is gonna go four, five, six gigahertz, and and then it didn't. Uh, but instead, uh, people uh, CPUs have still uh, gotten better, of course. Uh, but instead, they have more cores. Like this is like a, a rough average, like Steam player database. What's the average physical cores uh, that they get? So you know, for a while it was free. Free is a weird average. Nobody has free core machine. I think I think it's a thing. But it means that most people have two or four. Right? That's that's basically what you should take out of it. But you see that, uh, in especially like the last what is it, like five, six, seven, eight, eight years, it has clearly started to go up and up and up. And you see modern machines have like eight or 12 physical cores. And like when you start going for logical cores, 16, 20, the sky's the limit. So <clears throat> the problem is that with new hardware comes new challenges because it was a, a, a really good thing for games and most softwares, but games were a very big one at the time, is that when you start making a game, it doesn't really matter that much that it runs terribly because in three or four years when you're gonna ship, like the average CPU frequency will have doubled or at least like increased significantly. Uh, and actually taking, e taking like uh, benefits of a faster CPU, if it's just like clock speed, is really easy. You just have to do nothing. Uh, well, you may have some actually like interesting sync issues if your cycle starts getting too fast and you don't take that into account. But most of the time, the only thing you have to do is nothing. You just ship and faster CPU means the game runs faster and everybody's super happy. That was, that was glorious. But it stopped at some point. Uh, and instead, we just had more cores. And if you just run the same game from like 20 years ago with more cores, you're going to notice it's not going to go like X time faster because that's not magic anymore. And you used to this, the, the famous great software trick that this guy was desperately asking for. So as I was saying, I am Mathieu, or Mathieu, uh, depending on how well you are at pronouncing French words. Uh, I'm a tech lead at Paradox Development Studio. Uh, I'm working mostly on Hearts of Fire Run uh, for these days, but I also started looking at, uh, well, I can't tell you about, but stuff. You know how it works. I'm looking at stuff. Yeah, that's that. Put that on my resume. Doing stuff. So this talk is about the importance of multi-threading uh, and why you really need to consider it if you're making desktop applications nowadays. Uh, concurrency models, like kind of what kind of concurrency thing we can do. I'm not gonna go into very formal thing. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing like Anthony at the first row. I'm like a bit scared. No, no, don't worry about it. It's very simple. More like what kind of models did we use in our games? Uh, in practice, so yeah, how do we do that in our games? Uh, and a few tips and tricks, things I've noticed and we've noticed around the years when we try to just use more cores to uh, to make our games go blue. Uh, 
So uh, this is a COVID talk. Uh, it was made in uh, 2021, uh, which I discovered a great thing, which is I can do a talk from the comfort of my own house with a very nice like uh, home PC with like, I don't know, 16 threads and, and RTX and blah, 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 and make cool demos. Uh, but that was, that was the world before. This is not the world of today. Today I have a very nice toaster with like two cores and four threads. <laughs> Uh, an i5 uh, and 8 HD graphics. Just just for the ta sake of tasting, I tried booting one of the games I wanted to demo today during Bryce conference. I think he was over explaining like half of his keynote before I saw the main menu. But luckily, I'm insane and we have technology today and my machine in Stockholm is actually still running. So I just booted up the VPN and I'm gonna just run all the demos through my remote workstation with Windows Remote Desktop. And you're like, but Matthew, I didn't know games work for remote desktop. I'm like, we didn't know either, but we had to adapt because for two years, everybody was working from home. We discovered an interesting amount of bugs that nobody thought about at the time. <clears throat> All right, so multi-threading. Why, when, where, etc., etc. So if you're anything like me, you're a bit old, hopefully maybe... I'm older than I look, I know. Uh, but you know, P-threads are old, right? Like uh, P-threads were in, uh, introduced in 1995. And I think <clears throat> just about every software engineering class from that era onwards will teach you P threads or an amount of like coding with threads. And now if you're anything like me too, you just basically never use that for the rest of a couple of years. Because I, I went to like server applications, I work in bank, I work in finance. We knew that threads were a thing, but we did not really use that much. And on the desktop, it was even worse. And one of the big reasons I think is that if you try to buy a desktop machine, like even a gamer machine, uh, up until a, light, a long time, you didn't have more than one core anyway. So you could use threads, sure, but mostly that would be used to do like background tasks or just like, you know, wait for something to happen. But if you're just trying to do more stuff at the same time, just compute more stuff, just if you fork like 10 threads and you have one core, it's just going to be worse than if you just don't. Uh, and yeah, like consumer CPUs, I don't know, like, more than one actual core, because we had multi-threading in 2002. That was like the beginning of having several threads running on this at the same time on a PC. Uh, but yeah, you have to wait 2005 to get like a core to do a core duo or something like that to start getting like more than one core on your on your consumer grade machine. Uh, and like, even if you look at Intel, like it was not even the default. It was high end machine for a while. It took like until 2010 since they stopped basically selling you a machine that didn't have at least two cores. So what does it mean for consumer PCs, especially people who play all games who really think that since the graphics are not that great, they should play on toasters, uh, is that they don't really have super strong machines. And for the longest time, we didn't have a huge incentive to use many cores. Like the 2000 mostly was like, eh, or like, nobody's going to notice. Uh, and you know, efficiency is limited by the number of CPUs. And if you ever subscribe a CPU by putting more threads, uh, active threads, than you have cores. It's just worse than, uh, than, um, than if you don't. Uh, for, for the story, I used to work on a web, web servers as my first job, and we did some benchmarking with Apache. We, at the time, every time you get an HTTP GET request, it just starts a new worker thread and starts serving it. Uh, it's really interesting how fast you can kill it with just like a simple loop that just uh, the, 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 does a bunch of cold calls. Like you will murder the hell out of it. While like, the very more fancy like uh, web servers that they sold us at the time in, in banking, they spawn one more thread per core and then they just have a queue and then you just pick the next thing in the queue when there is something available, which is way more efficient than forking a thread every time somebody goes a request. And that, that, that translates for just about anything. Like just in general, do not create more work threads than you have cores. It's just not efficient. Unless some of them are going to sleep because they're going to do like IO, they're going to sleep, get waken up, blah, blah, blah. But in practice, you shouldn't have more active threads than you have cores. That's, that's kind of the basic of the machine. Uh, and that's not even counting the fact that most players nowadays all like to have something open on another tab or another their window that is eating half their resources because it's made in like... I don't want to name any framework, but you know the one that everybody makes apps about that's based on JavaScript and makes everything takes like all the RAM and all the CPU and probably embeds Chromium. Like, yes, or they have YouTube or they're streaming or whatever. Like, even if you have 16 cores, you're probably going to get 14, 16, 15 on a good day, depending on what they're doing. <clears throat> and that's excluding antiviruses that decide to scan the game files when you load them. All right. So, um... Yeah, as I said before, average desktop for a while had like one or two CPUs, and good multi-threaded code is hard to write. So you know, here's an here's an easy thing: don't bother, right? It's hard to make good multi-thread code. 
most of the consumers in the 2000s do not have several calls. A problem solved kind of itself. Right? Just I guess you can have like some spawn some future tasks or stuff like that for like a background thread. Just load some stuff in the background. Call me back when you're done. Things like that. But as far as your game loop is concerned and the thing that has to be reactive, eh, just focus on your thread and the main thread, the, the one you start with, and you're good. Uh, but the times are changing, as I mentioned before. Uh, so that's uh, that's the Steam player based core, physical core count that I try to make a graph of. So as you can see, the uh, the, the red here is the pe like that's the bottom one is the people with only one core. I'm, I'm, I'm amazed that there were still some people there, but you know, they're basically in existence now. Uh, and again, that stops at 2021 because that's when I made this graph. But you can assume that the trend is clearly continuing in the same fashion. Like again, 10 years ago, half of the people had only two cores. But now they're barely like, I don't know, 12%. I guess if you continue there, you're probably, I don't know, something like 10% maybe. Uh, and yeah, like even the four cores on their way out now. Uh, and that's physical cores, not logical cores. So if you get more high in CPU, you usually double that number uh, for effective threads you can use. Uh, and it continues that way. And then we even start screwing crazy people with 16 like physical cores on their PC. Um, so yeah, the times are changing, and uh, this graph is a bit hard to read, but the idea is like, like how much of the CPU are you actually using depending on how many, uh, how many threads do you actually spawn? And you know, for a while, you would just have, uh, like if, if, if someone had only one CPU, uh, wait, wait, wait. yeah, okay, so if you have only one worker of threads, you could use like, eh, about half the resources. Nowadays, you really need to have a lot of worker threads running if you want to keep usage of the machine and make sure that, you know, if your game ambition goes with the times and most game ambition go only go one way and it's up, uh, there was some very good design decision now about like simplifying stuff. But over time, usually games get more complex, more rich, people just want more stuff. And more stuff means more CPU time that needs to be computed. And if you're not taking advantage of the fact that there are 16 cores that could be working on a machine, uh, well, Again, the, the guy, the guy, the guy that, that made that post probably opened the game and then looked at the task manager, and the task manager was like CPU utilization 12%, and he was like, what the fuck? Why can't you go faster? So yeah, <clears throat> like if you have a, a, a mono-threaded application today, you're gonna use at best like, I don't know, like a quarter of the, C of the, of the user base CPUs, and that's just an average. Uh, you're probably worst on many cases, especially gamers who have like a higher-end machine. Uh, it's not a bonus anymore for uh, like high-end desktops or whatever. It, it has to adapt. You, you need to put that into your code. So with that in mind, let's see how Paradox did it or didn't, depending on the era. Excuse me, I'm just gonna take that. <clears throat> so uh, here's a timeline that's almost complete. We we have. I mean, it's still good enough about like what kind of games we have made. So we make strategy games, uh, grand strategy is the term. Uh, I think somebody made it up in, a, in, a, in an interview once and then we made it like a genre for ourselves. You know, what, what they say, right? Like if you can't find a niche that you work, just create your own niche and just, just be the de facto leader, I guess. Uh, so uh, the oldest one that uh, still fits on this timeline is called Europa Universalis. It's still in production today. I, in fact, I think they released the DLC for it like this week. So it's kind of venerable, but it still has an active player base, and it's basically uh, a game about playing uh, like a, any nation state from the Renaissance onward to the Napoleonic era. It started from a board game, and that's the whole series that started the studio originally. Um, in 2016, we, realized, uh, we released Hearts of Fire and Four, which is the game I, uh, I've been spending most of my last two years, which is centered about World War II. The same year we released Stellaris, which uh, is based on the same... Uh, ideas of a other game, but it's uh, completely like sci-fi or speculation. It's less historical. Uh, for the story, uh, Hearts of Iron was supposed to release a year before, but you know how game development works. Sometime uh, you get delays. Uh, in uh, 2019, we released Imperator, which was a game that was short-lived, but was about the Rome era, the Roman era, and there's basically a lot of what Europe, uh, Europe Universalis 4 does, but in the Roman era. Uh, 2020 was our biggest hit, and maybe one of the most likely game you've heard about. Uh, maybe, there's another one the next. But uh, that's the first time I heard people that I never uh, heard talking about games before started talking that they played this game. So I think this is maybe the most likely you will heard, have heard about. It's the medieval one. Uh, I think we were really helped by this uh, series called Game of Thrones. Uh, people were like, wow, I can play all the Game of Thrones character in this thing, but also it's actual Europe. Like, yeah, and also India, if you're into that stuff. Like, we go all the way. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's a game about dynasties and plotting your way through medieval times, the Crusades, 
starting with the Vikings and all the way to basically kind of matching up with the U4 uh, era. So like it stops when the high middle age is about to end. Oh, and very recently we had a game called Victoria Free, uh, which is, uh, internet has called the communism simulator, but I'm told by management that I should not be calling that anymore. Uh, it's a game about the industrial revolution and the awakening of, uh, of uh, political consciousness in, uh, in people from like 1830 to, uh, to, to the Great War. So yeah, it's about simulation of economics, politics, and yeah, it's basically a communism simulator. Uh, and I want to make an arbitrary line here. And it's not only because it feels well in the middle of my slide, there's actually a logic behind it. <clears throat> uh, between those two games, uh, basically the Rise of Stellaris, uh, we had a big change uh, inside the studio uh, because those three games were in development at the same time. Uh, all those had been shipped and we started realizing that a lot of games were basically copy pasting the previous game, then removing everything they didn't need and then started adding what they want. So that's why, for example, like uh, I think up until a while there was a class in, a, in, in, in Hearts of Iron called CEU Free Date, which calls for a date in Europe Universalis Free, so the one that was released like a decade before. And we started realizing that, come on, can we, maybe we should stop this. So we, create, we, we try to uplift a bunch of things that are common to every strategy games we do, and we mostly do strategy games, out somewhere in a component we call Germany that sits somewhere between the engine and the uh, and, and, and the games. And that way a bunch of stuff was refactored and a bunch of like game concept and game loops have changed, which will drive the rest of this talk. Uh, I'll, I'll get onto it. But let's look at some graphs, because graphs are cool, and I, I like making graphs uh, and then making screenshots of graphs. So uh, this is the average frame time, like how many uh, milliseconds it takes to render a frame, uh, which is what the base game loop does all the time. It just renders frames, right? And if you know anything about games, you know that 16.67 is a very important number, because it's 1 divided by 60. And that's where, basically where everybody lives, because most monitors, TVs, blah, 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 run at 60 hertz or 60 FPS frames per second. And so by definition, if you take more than 16 milliseconds to render, you cannot do 60 frames per second. We're not doing AAA games. Most people will not notice if this doesn't run uh, at 60 FPS unless there's a tough thing at the top telling them. But shh, don't tell them that. They will be very upset. <laughs> But allegedly, we should target 60 FPS, and you know, in some cases, we manage. Uh, the, the bar is about here. And in some others, we don't. Uh, why is that? Uh, because our games do three things, usually, when they are very quickly, very, very, very basically. Uh, they take, which is like update the game simulation. Uh, they, they render, and then they update. So uh, actually, it's technically the other way around. But um, so rendering is basically just sending commands to the GPU. It's basically GPU time. It's GPU just do your magic, transform all those numbers, triangles, and whatever into pixels. I still try to get my head around shaders, but that still hurts. Uh, and update is basically take all the game simulation, transform that into a bunch of things that you will be able to send to the GPU. That's basically the, 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 the two steps are basically graphics, and that, take, that's, that, that step is simulation. What you might notice is that there is no simulation uh, blocking the uh, the rendering on, on the newer games, which is Victoria Free and uh, CK. But everything else has that. It's because we changed a lot the way the game works. Uh, and now both can run at the same time. All games could not. I will go back to it. But what you can immediately derive is that the newer games are kind of better at, uh, at doing that. Uh, you will also notice that Stellaris is quite fast when you start the game. Like, uh, basically, this is when you start, the, you create a fresh new galaxy, you start your adventure. Uh, but then when you start playing like 200 years into the game simulation and the galaxy is spanned, there is multi-spanning empires, big walls and stuff like that. And some creatures from behind the, the, the pale try to invade and destroy everything. Uh, you start having way more stuff to simulate and that starts breaking down a bit more. Which is a thing that's been plaguing most of our games and continues to <laughs> do so. Uh, so if we look at just the tick time, which is how much does the simulation take? Uh, you will notice that Victoria is actually the one with the heaviest simulation. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of, we simulate a lot of what we call pops, which is like demographics, basically. So, you know, like a German Catholic uh, guy who lives in this state in Germany and really wants to vote for this or that party and has those economic, so, like, basically we simulate like uh, what kind of jobs they do. Uh, what economic circumstances that led the, that that brings them to, and then what they think about that, and then what kind of thing they want to do about it. So like, try to vote for somebody else, or start a revolution, or just change factories, or just move to a better place. It's it's again, it's a, it's it's an industrial revolution simulator with politics. So 
the more population grows in the world, the, wor the, worse, the, the worse it gets, and there's a lot of economical simulation in there. Uh, CK3 is here, and then you have Hoy, and here you have Stellaris and things. You can see the same things here. Uh, I did not put Hoy late game here. It's probably around there, too, because, again, uh, Hoy starts in 36. There's not a lot of war going on, but in 44, things get a bit, like, uh, warmer. <clears throat> all right, so we all use the same engine. engine. It's an in-house engine called Klauswitz, uh, named after Karl von Klauswitz, some German nerd who wrote a lot about uh, warfare in the, uh, in, the 18th, in the 19th century. Uh, up until Imperator, as I said before, we just fork the engine at some point. Just, just fork it and then it's your own copy. It has advantage and disadvantages. Advantages is as the tech leader of Hoy, nobody can tell me anything. If I don't like something in the engine, it's just gone. Like that. It's pretty, pretty liberating some days. Uh, the drawback is if someone else makes something very smart, then I don't have it. I have to find a way to backport it. And if it's like 10 years old, that's not going to happen. Or very painfully. Uh, and there is a big generational job between Stellaris and Imperator, which we call Germany, which is, again, named after another nerd, this time Swiss, who also wrote a lot about warfare. Uh, he's an armchair general, I think, in practice. He's a guy who terrorized warfare a lot, but never actually went into any battle. Uh, once as a tourist, I think, like he was Swiss. You know, Swiss don't fight a lot of battles. So he went as a tourist for the Prussian army, I think. But anyway, that's, pa that's past the point. The, pa the point is, uh, we put a lot of like common functions in, in that module, like map rendering, and a bit about how does the game updates. So how do we use threads? How do threads work with this? So the first time we had multi-threading from release was Crusader the Kings 2 in 2012. Uh, I think Victoria 2 had threads very late for like one very specific bit that was slow and we couldn't get another, another way and it was more like somebody like, shit, this really is just not gonna make it. I'm gonna try doing this thread thing real quick in like 2010. Uh, <clears throat> most of it was done through TBB, for thread, Intel thread binding blocks for those who have never heard about it, uh, which is a small library from Intel that's starting to be, I don't know how old is TBB now, like 15, 20 years maybe. Probably something like that. Uh, it's a very simple way of just create like, co 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 like it's the equivalent of C17 standard uh, algorithm, but with parallel. Basically, if you want a very simple thing, and 99% of the thing we use is parallel four, which is like four but parallel. You just you give it a collection and you say for each item in this collection, do this. It will just do that, chunk it into as many blocks as you consider good and spread that into a, a, around the thread pool that you define with a size. And that, that's a very easy way of just starting having a worker thread pool that will just chunk work faster than if it was only one CPU doing it. <clears throat> and most of it at the time was focused on simming, uh, speeding up the world simulation. Like most of the rendering, graphics, none of that used threads at all or mostly at all. I think we had one exception, we had an audio thread uh, that was just independent of the rest of the game because if your audio stops running at some point, people will notice way faster than graphics. Like, people can take frame starters, but gra uh, audio starters are just horrible, so we just make sure that it never happened. <laughs> but everything else was just, the world simulation is too slow, so if I have to uh, compute like how are those like, uh, millions of people gonna vote the next election, instead of doing it like for uh, 20 million people on one thread, I just do it over X threads, and that's, that's the kind of thing we used to do. So demo time, because I talk a lot about our games, but I mean, I don't know, how many of you are familiar with product games? Maybe I should have asked, asked that for, oh wow, holy shit. That's not the, the basic demographic I expected. <coughs> well, for those who don't, demo time. And that's the crazy moment where I try to log in on my remote desktop. Wow, it's still there actually, amazing. Okay, and I am typing somewhere else, or, I don't know, where am I typing? Might be a password showing up later in the stock because I was typing somewhere and I was not. There we go, it works, epic. So, this is Hearts of Fire and 4. I think it's gonna run at like 30 FPS because that's the refresh rate of the, um, of the Windows remote desktop. Uh, playing your game through remote desktop will make you find bugs that you did not think about. Uh, the main one is vSync. You know, this idea that you have to wait for monitor sync to do anything. Uh, if you have 30 uh, FPS uh, V-Sync, you're gonna spend a lot of time waiting on the monitor sync and doing nothing. People complained that the game was way slower on the remote desktop and they did not understand why. I'm like, just disable V-Sync. Like, wow, it's twice as fast. <laughs> cool, so, uh, it's about World War II. Uh, so you can play any country you weren't uh, in 1936 that exists. Uh, people with various hats and mustache will, will turn out to be evil in the end. Um, <clears throat> 
Uh, but you know, like if you don't like any of the of the standard one, you can start and try playing as Luxembourg, for example. I would not recommend that as a first playthrough. This is not an easy play. This is not a playthrough. Don't play Luxembourg. Uh, but to just show the game, I'm gonna start with uh, the Italy uh, Hatman because it's the only one who starts at war in the game early on, and that gives you a better idea of what's happening. So this is this is the, the view you'll see in most of our games. You'll see a very uh, a, a, a map from some distance that you can zoom in. Uh, sorry, this, this zoom is really not fast. All the way to start seeing the train going choo 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 around and stuff like that. We were actually forbidden to announce that we had trains before Victoria Free because we were jealous that we had them before. Uh, for a game about industrial revolution, you gotta have trains. Like, that has to happen. Uh, <clears throat> Cool, so you know, you can do a bunch of things like uh, decide which technology your country should research. So for example, I don't know, let's say we need to get 19, 18 gun. Yeah, it's time, it's 30 seconds, guys, keep up with the time. We can start inventing stuff like, I don't know, like a better machine tool. You know, you can, you can do a bunch of things like that. You know, the classic thing, you have your research and you can manage your production. The main thing you want to notice is that nothing seems to be happening. Like, you know, nothing is moving. Like, I mean, we have like a weather looking like it's, uh, you have a storm somewhere and things like that, but nothing seems to be moving. And if you look at the bottom, uh, at the top right, you will notice that there's a clock that says that it's January 1st, 1936, it's 12, and it's paused. And that is the basis of all our games. It's real time possible, right? You can pause at any time and we just have a world simulation that runs. Uh, we, you can change how fast you want it to run from like, very painfully slow to somewhat fast, uh, one to five. Uh, and then when you unpause, the game will just simulate and you can set up a bunch of alerts to pause the game for you, or you can pause whenever you want. And if not, as you play, the simulation just goes. So how does the player interact with the simulation? Uh, basically, you give orders, which immediately usually don't do anything. Like I started researching something, but actually no progress has been made yet because most of the thing you do is just, you give orders, and then the simulation every day is like, okay, what kind of order did you do? Okay, something happened. So for example, if I, I tell my nerds to start researching, they actually haven't made any progress. They will only make progress as, as, uh, as time progresses because every day some researchers will actually try to figure out what is this like 1918 guns we heard about. Uh, and the same goes for units. So uh, if you know something about history, you know that in 1936, uh, uh, Ethiopia, uh, uh, Italy has decided to invade Ethiopia. Not their finest moment, but then again, it's World War II. It's not many people's finest moments for a while. Uh, it gets better. Right? Uh, and so I can technically like assign these guys to some uh, some Italian generals of my choice, like for example this Giovanni man, uh, and then I can like draw a front line, uh, and then I can say, okay, I just make an offensive like this. And again, nothing happens, and I can say, okay, start the offensive, and still nothing will happen because again, the game is paused. But if I unpause, ah, you'll see that some, uh, so suddenly stuff will start happening. You know, like my, my guys will start moving, they'll start fighting those guys. And then if you pick up the details, sorry, uh, Mussolini has opinions. Yeah, sure, whatever, Mussolini. Um, and yeah, you can see that there's a battle happening and we are supposed to be winning. And if I unpause, you'll see that things are happening. So that's the kind of, that's the bulk of our games, right? Like, there's a game simulation happening, regardless of what the player does. We, the player is just kind of an observer to this crazy world. And you have the control over one uh, actor over this, usually a country, in some of the games a character. And you just give orders and that takes, that's taken into account in the simulation and then the simulation continues. That's the, basically the, the basic framework of our games. Uh, again, if you look at the timer at the top, you can look at how fast the simulation progresses. And this is a crazy machine with like 20 cores, very far away from what our average player has. No one is, but you, you can see it's still, reasonably fast, we simulate like 24 hours in a matter of seconds. It's actually better than when I did the last demo because I had got more performed more calls than the last time. And also we've, we've done some performance improvements since. So that's the kind of game we got. Now, how does that actually work technically speaking? Let's go back to the slides if I can. I can, there we go, epic, cool. <laughs> so. How do you make a game loop? Uh, if you've never made a game before, uh, usually what you do is that you handle the input. So you know you, you look at what events have been pressed since the last time you ran into this loop. So like you know uh, somebody pressed a key or the mouse has moved, blah blah blah. And you just 
react to that. So, you know, like someone clicks on a button, well, you should probably do that, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, then you update your simulation. So, you know, like time has passed. So depending on how much time has passed, you advance the simulation more or less. That's, that's the basic. Uh, and then you render the results. So you basically, you look at the simulation, you see, okay, what, what should the, the world look now? And then you just um, show that and then you loop again. That's, that's basically every game ever, roughly speaking. Uh, since we're a simulation and we really care a lot about how does that consistently work in, in multiplayer, the way we do it at Paradox is kind of similar, but not entirely. So we have this thing called we process commands. Uh, we handle the inputs, we update the UI, the graphics, and then we render. Uh, what's the big difference? Processing commands in our sense is that the simulation will only change in that step here. Uh, because we have a simulation, and it only progresses when a command tells it, tells it, tells it to do something. And what is a command? Uh, for example, if a player gives an order, that's a command. And we send that over the wire, and we make sure that every player, uh, every computer, every client, just replaces it in the same order. So it's basically, there's a queue. It's a queue of like things that needs to be done for the, for the simulation to progress. Uh, and once, oh, sorry. And once everything that was in the queue has been processed, we, uh, we take into uh, account the input, we update the UI, and we render. That's, that's basically the core loop of all the games uh, up until Stellaris, including Stellaris. Uh, and there's a special command called tech, which just makes the simulation advance by one unit of time. So, you know, in some games it's a day, in some games it's an hour, in some games it's a year, depending on what kind of simulation and what scale you want to do. Uh, and, who and how do we decide how, how, how often that command uh, comes up is up to the server. So if you pose, that command never shows up, so the simulation is basically stuck in time. But as soon as uh, you start uh, imposing and increasing the speed, uh, more, uh, uh, more, more and more often uh, on a timer, we just queue a, a new command, just advance the simulation by one day or one hour. So yeah, uh, game states, what we, what we call the game state is like basically the state of the world, the simulation, anything that represents the, what, what the actual changing bits of the game are about. It can only change through command execution. So like if you click on the UI, for example, the UI will never in directly change the game. It will queue a command that says, hey, the player wants to do this. And then sometimes even the command can get rejected. It happens when people start lagging behind and they, uh, for example, ask an army that's dead to move because they don't know that it's dead yet because they're like lagging behind a couple of days in the simulation. That happens. <clears throat> uh, yeah, it's exactly. So yeah, you, if you click on the UI, you will only, only queue new command. We will not change the game directly. So we have only one point when we know that the game simulation is running. Uh, and yeah, the server queues a command to advance the time by one unit at real time intervals, depending on the speed and if you post or not. So we have a thing called tick increments. Depending on the game, the tick uh, represents a unit of time. Uh, so, you know, it could be an hour. Hoy, Hearts of Iron 4, sorry, I'm going to use a lot of acronyms. Uh, Hearts of Iron 4, Hoy, use a lot, uh, plays everything by the hour because, you know, it's World War II. Uh, some battles are decided in a matter of hours and you, we, need to, we need to be that specific. Uh, Cruiser the Kings 2, and actually 3, I don't know why I made 2. Uh, and Europa Universalis 4, it's, it's, a sim it's, it's a story that happens over years, so we only simulate the passage of time by the day. Uh, Stellaris is a fraction of a day, which is one-tenth of a day, if I recall correctly. Uh, the reason why they do that is that most things change only once per day, but the ships in the world move every tenth of a day because else we realize that they kind of jitter a bit too much and that makes space battle really ugly. But most of it in, uh, in this in, is, is that way. And I think uh, Victoria Free is quarter of a day for some reason. I'm not 100% sure, but they simulate days by a quarter of, at the time. Like, you know, morning, uh, noon, afternoon, night. And there's no in-between. Like, the simulation is either like uh, on January 36, like at 12, or, uh, or it's on January 36 at 13. Like, in-between, that does not exist. Uh, like, the, the client cannot really respond to anything until that simulation has passed one day. Uh, because else we would have, like, synchronization issue between clients and things like that. It's, it's lockstep, basically, in the way that it moves. So if you look at a sampler, uh, this is Optic, the, 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 the thing that I keep my eyes on most of the time now. Uh, if you were there last year, I made a talk about how to use Optic and, uh, and similar thing. You can find it at home on the internet. Uh, it's a pretty cool tool. Uh, and it gives you a profiling of like what Hearts of Fire would look when I made this talk, which I think was uh, two years ago. It's a bit better now, but that's a rough idea of how it goes. So at the top one is the core utilization. 
so green is good because the green means like you're using a lot of cores. Uh, black is bad because it means you're not using cores, and red means you have some form of contention, uh, which usually you should not have a lot. Sometimes you have a bunch. Uh, the classic thing is the observer effect, right? As I'm measuring the game, I'm using uh, I'm using more resources than than normal. So for example, my my profiler needs one core. My Game assumes that it has all the cores, and then maybe YouTube decides to do something or whatever uh, is open on Chrome. So sometimes that's why you get a lot of a, a bit of red. But the rough idea is like, what's the time frame and the usage of the of the of the of the CPU? And as you notice, there are some bits that are pretty good, and there are some bits that are really admissibly bad, depending on what you do. Uh, the one at the top is the main thread, uh, and then everything else is like some of the work threads. I think for simplicity, this was done on my old work machine, which had only eight cores or threads, or both. I think it was both. Uh, so that, that fits better on the graph. But you can notice like a lot of those are doing nothing for a long of the time. So this bit is what we call the session update, which is basically process the commands. In this case, it's processing like uh, hourly updates. So it's just updating the game to make it go from like one hour to the next. So that's the game simulation, basically. Uh, this is most of the uh, UI updates. So that's where we, uh, we decide what, what the map should show. Uh, update the animation state <coughs> of most uh, objects, things like that. <coughs> and that's the rendering part where we just like chug a bunch of stuff at the GPU and then present the scene on the uh, on the monitor, wait for VSync if we have to, uh, and then we just loop again. So as you will notice, it's mostly focused on updating the simulation in those games. Like that, that, that takes most of our time. Our, our games are not super graphically demanding, as you might have noticed. Uh, so it's it's a lot about that, and as you will notice, some systems are okay at using cores, and some systems not so much. So the idea is that each subsystem runs in a sequence. For example, if you I don't know if you can read it, but like this one is is called like supply system update. So just updating the state of supplies for every uh, every unit in the world, because uh, it's World War II. So it's a lot about like, do you have supply? Did you get encircled? Are you starving because it's uh, it's the desert and you're doing a lala main or whatever else? Uh, and then we have, I can't remember what, uh, W is weather, okay, so that's the weather simulation, then we have like the uh, strategic air simulations, so like planes fighting each other, things like that. Uh, and then we have country early update, which is for each country, do a bunch of stuff. Uh, and that's kind of all alpha and omega, because uh, the, the main actor in the game is a country. So everything we do is basically update what this country does, and that includes like moving its units, for example, you can see country units updates, and a bunch of other things like that. And finally, we have the update of the AI, because everything that the player does not control is controlled by an AI, and which means most actors in the game are actually AIs, because there's like, I don't know, uh, 200 countries in the game uh, in total. Maybe at the start, you're gonna get like 50 or 100. The player will play one, the AI will play the, 91, the other 99, and every hour or day, they need to do something. They don't do every, something every day or every hour, because it's usually not necessary. Like, for example, they don't have to decide which tech to research every hour. That doesn't matter. A tech takes like 30 in-game days to research or sometimes 100. So there's no point. But for example, they have to react uh, like on, on, on troops uh, and then think about diplomacy. So it's still like, it's not big, but if, if you have 200 countries that need to think and you try to split them across time, they still take some time. So every subsystem, it runs in a sequence, right? So it's like, first we update the supply, then we update the weather, then we update the, uh, the airplanes, then we update every country, then we update every AI, blah, blah, blah. So how does core utilization factor into that? It entirely depends on how each system is implemented, right? So if the guy who implemented the supply system thought about using threads and chucked a bunch of parallel for, then it's gonna be good at using threads. If the guy who implemented the supply system did not think about threads and I did not scream at him, well, then it's gonna run on one core and it's gonna take forever. That's basically, that's the rule that we had to leave for, well, a lot of time, actually. And as you can guess, it's not the best way of approaching this is the problem, right? Because as a rule of a farm, uh, the more recent it is, the more it's likely that someone, probably me, has screamed about threat efficiency and tried to say maybe we should do it a different way. The older it is, the more likely that it is really just taking, like, Basically, like a board game simulation, everybody takes a turn, and that's done in a very sequential and uh, and, and mono uh, thread uh, manner. We have retrofitted a bunch of systems over the years, but not all of them. 
And people who have researched a bit any game development know that most games normally render on a different frame that the game simulation does. You will notice that these games don't because they're ancient in that way. Mm. Uh, we came from a board game. Uh, that absolute insane setup here is Europa Universal is the original board game. Uh, you will see why we made a fortune in video games. It's because I don't know who kind of maniac will play a board game that required that. Like, look at this shit. This is insane. <laughs> so yeah, uh, I think someone luckily saw that in the early 2000s and say, you guys are absolutely insane. Most of this shit should be simulated by a computer. Uh, and that's why we're here. Well, especially me, but in general. And the problem is, it still can be felt in some game systems, especially the older ones, which means they're made to be resolved as a board game. And many board games, uh, especially back before we thought about how long does it take to play a board game, if you ever played like historical, like if you're a board game player, you've noticed that modern board game has this thing where every player can play its turn at the same time, potentially. It's not just that they like threats, they also like people to go home. Uh, so, you know, if you play some other uh, games, you will notice that it does not happen, and you have to resolve each player one by one, and the other seven are just to sleep. It's basically what a game does sometime in the same ID, but instead of players, it's scores. Uh, and so, for example, we have a bunch of systems like units and combats that are very deterministic. It's like, Germany, move your armies one by one. Okay, you're done. UK, move all your armies one by one. Cool, Soviet Union. It's going to take a while. <clears throat> Uh, and it's hard to address in an existing game, right? When the design is done that way, it's hard to go back and say, actually, no, everybody moves at the same time. You get like a million problem with like a uh, race condition and the thing just blows up in your face. So another issue we noticed is that if you paralyze by system, uh, you get a problem that is the entity grain size. Like how many entities do you have in your system? Because even if you chuck them into a parallel four, it may or may not work that well, depending on how many cores you got and how many uh, entities you have. For example, we have uh, about 13,000 tiles on the map, like provinces, like basically board game squares, right? So if you do parallel 4 on 13,000, uh, it's going to be great, right? It doesn't really matter how many cores you get. It will be nicely spread out. Every, every, every core will grab like 100 at a time, maybe go through them, and you will get a really good core utilization. We have 800 states, which are like geographical collections of uh, provinces. 800 is still pretty good. Usually, you can still keep that going. We have, in theory, 300 countries. In practice, maybe 100. That starts becoming a problem. Because here is the thing. This is, this is real world. Aircraft production in World War II, OK? So the top line is the USA. That's how many aircraft they made like per year. Then that's Germany. That's the USSR, the UK, Japan, Canada. And I'm just I'm going to stop looking. There's no point, OK? Do you see the issue? You can assume that if you're simulating the industry of those countries, this is kind of a way you can see how much each, 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 uh, each unit of processing will take. And if you try to chuck that on like a multi-core system, you'll realize that basically your first thread will simulate the USA for the end of time. Uh, the second one will do Germany and probably have enough time to do the UK or Japan afterwards. The, second, the third one will do like the USSR, Japan, Canada, and the last one will do every other country, and then all your other thread will be waiting for the US to finish. So the big thing is that, yes, sometimes uh, it doesn't really, if you just go by entity and your entities of like completely disproportionate size, like for example, in our game, we have usually five major or six major players and everybody else is, is inconsistent, is in consequence. You can have more threads than, uh, if you can start having more threads than that, you're not really gaining much. You're just waiting on the big five to finish simulating. Uh, it actually turns some optimization into pessimization. <coughs> Because the huge thing we used to do before was to say, oh, let's not simulate everybody on the same day. So, you know, like you, you take the ID of the country, you do a modulo 24, and if your module lines up, it's your turn to update. So, for example, instead of everybody uh, putting every, every country in one daily update, you put every, uh, like a 24th of the country every hour instead. That looks like a good idea. And so you start realizing that some hours you'll have basically nothing to do because it's going to be all those small countries and that's going to take like a less than a millisecond. And then on some hours, you're going to have the US and a bunch of inconsequential stuff. And it would have been as fast to simulate all those countries at the same time as simulating 124th every time because, again, you run into the problem that you have a bottleneck that is the five big ones. So, yeah, to, to give you a graphical view, it's like... We update countries, then we update the units, and then we update the provinces. And if you have three cores and you're lucky, 
then you know each core will take like one entity in each system. That's the kind of ID that we used to run with. And obviously, as I mentioned before, when the jobs start having different sizes, you know, it doesn't matter how many cores I throw at the problem. It's, you, you can notice very quickly that I can have 20 billion cores. You're never going to use more than two in practice. So yeah, entities in your system are not equal. Uh, you as fast as the slowest one takes to finish, which as long as you start having enough entities, it's fine. If you have really big entities, it's a problem. And also, here's a funny thing. If the US is big with its industry at uh, simulating planes, there's a likely chance that it's also going to have the biggest army, so it's going to have the most units to simulate, and it's going to have the most army that needs supply to simulate, and the biggest merchant navy that needs to supply these people, etc. And so in every system, you're going to see the same biggest countries, or basically like uh, groups of, uh, of, of entities just taking all the time, and everybody else being done, and being like, can we go now? So it was Good enough at the time, please don't quote me on that. Uh, it's still in production today and people keep complaining about it. Some systems are actually pretty good at utilizing all cores, especially the new ones. We managed to refit some of them, but some of them are just going to be a no-go. And uh, one of the biggest harder we have in Hoi is uh, House of Iron is uh, units and combats. Because due to the way it was made, it has to be everybody takes a turn. So. When you start the game, it's usually fine because you only have to simulate like the units of Ethiopia fighting the units of Italy. When the full World War II goes on and you have the Eastern Front, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the D-Day invasion um, and everything else at the same time, the, the Pacific Theater and China, it, it gets crazy. And it, there's no really good way around that. But that was the past, right? Let's talk about the present. What, what have we done since? Uh, so. At some point, what's very interesting is that we had three games in production uh, because, you know, due to the nature of video games, uh, we're always making new stuff. Like, people ask me, Matthew, like, why is Pirate We're always making new things. We can't announce it. But every, at any point, uh, a game that uh, a studio that has a, a bunch of games that hands in, like, three, two, or whatever, assume that there might be a four somewhere. Like, you know, it's the nature of the job, right? So at some point, we had Imperator, CK3, and VK3 in development. And interestingly, since all three were in development, all three were free to look at what we had in the past and say, hey, how do we improve that? And due to either no communication or just different opinions, they all went for a different model, which is cool because now we can see we won. Spoiler warning, it's CK. Uh, so the first thing we got for free, every game, woo, we, have a, we, have a, we have a session thread and a main thread now, epic. So bare minimum, well, cotization is two because we have one thread that's always processing the simulation. Uh, and the other one was just handling the inputs, updating the UI and the graphics, and uh, and then rendering. That's cool. That's that we get two calls for free. Well, actually, I lied because there's a lock. Because obviously, you can't always be reading the game state if you're modifying it in one thread. Because that's that's not how threads work and how data contention works. So what actually happens is we lock the game state to handle the inputs and update the UI, and then we unlock it and then we render what we stashed about to to uh, there, and then we go again. And when we process in command. We lock the game state, we actually change the game state, and then we unlock it. So it's not really two threads guaranteed. It's better, but it's not there yet. So, you know, you get some degrees of multi-threading for free. That's better than nothing, but it's still not perfect. Also, doesn't solve the biggest problem out of the box, because if you noticed before, rendering is always good when you can do it on another thread, but that's clearly not a bottleneck. I know a lot of AAA games with just like, the alpha and omega is how fast can you render that insane scene? That is usually not our problem. Our problem is how fast can we simulate those millions of pops who want to become communists. Uh, and so the problem is you also have some mutexes because, again, you can't be changing the simulation as, at the same time as the UI is trying to update because you risk waste conditions. Demo time, again. So this is Peter King 3, a game when you, see, you play a medieval dynasty. Uh, well, you play a medieval character in this part of medieval dynasty. And you, you game over if there's nobody left in your dynasty for you to inherit from and continue playing. So basically you get, your, your goal is to have children that bear your name and then you do all kind of medieval shenanigans you can assume. So if I start as a new game, there's a bunch of suggestions. Uh, Matilda is actually a good suggestion. Uh, because you play as an unmarried woman in, a, in the medieval era. So the first thing you can do is just seduce every other straight dude in the world and then convince them that since they like you, they should give you everything you want. That includes the Pope. That's a pretty powerful one, actually. 
as a, as a, as a thing, you, a, very, a very meta play with Matilda, which, which plays in Tusca, is you go to the Pope in Rome and you, you just seduce him, and then when he can't say you know anymore, you just ask him to declare everybody you hate or heretic and give you his land. That's, pretty, that's a powerful play. So uh, that's how it looks like. And if you zoom in, you start having like, uh, some cooler graphics. But not like the best graphics in the world, but yeah, OK. And especially, you can, uh, you can see characters now with 3D models. We, I know it's the future. Uh, we even have a royal court, but I don't know if I have access to one because I'm not a king. Uh, that's, that's, uh, I'm just a duchess, sadly speaking. Uh, but we have a bunch of 3D scenes left and right, and then you can, uh, you can go and talk to your, uh, to your, uh, to your lord, who is uh, with this guy, and things like that. So, same kind of type, a step we, we, we start in 1066. There's actually a start date in the 1800s, too, if you want to play the Vikings. <laughs> uh, but this is not the thing I want you to notice. Uh, we're in England. Who knows what happens in 1066, especially like around 15th of September. So we have this guy here in Normandy, and he has opinions. Especially opinions about who should be king of England, and he clearly thinks that it should not be this guy. So what's going to happen you know, if I impose the game is he's going to take some boats and start doing some French diplomacy with the English. Um, but first, I'm going to increase the speed to maximum madness. Um, and I'm going to impose. And you're going to start looking at the fact that uh, there's going to be some war happening very soon. Oh, I have an Evans. Yeah. All right, sure, go ahead. I have no idea what's happening. Just leave me alone. I don't care about Evans. Cool. Ah, you can see he started sieging some stuff. Uh, and there should be a war happening now. Yeah, I will express my and I love this man, sure, no problem. Who is this? Oh, it's the king of Croatia. Sure, I'm gonna see the love planet. That's pretty cool. Did it work? No, not yet. Damn. Okay. Oh. Okay, meanwhile, uh, people are fighting in England, and you should see that there's a war happening, and he's not doing too good. He's minus 60% war score. Uh, I wouldn't give him like a long time to happen. Okay, but I buy him a necklace. Come on. Uh, anyway, uh, the point I'm trying to make here is why I'm just talking shenanigans. Have you noticed the date at the bottom? Have you noticed that two years has passed already in the simulation? I'm gonna unpause. Just, just look at the numbers going. That's the simulation of days in the in the game. Uh, uh, yeah, like, oh, come on, have they won now or not? No. Just leave me alone. That's the problem of playing a character. You have to do stuff. Oh, there we go. There we go, I think England has a, has a new face now. Uh, and it looks like uh, it's a different guy now. So yeah, it, like by the time I was talking to shenanigans, like the game has simulated three years and you barely saw anything going. Uh, and that's because CK is stupidly fast uh, in the way it simulates the world. Because, you know, as I'm talking and doing my scheme and trying to just like sing a love ballad to the king of Croatia in the hope that I can inherit his domain or something, uh, everybody else in the world is doing that too. And there's a lot of them, all the way to India. Uh, and if you zoom in, like, you know, it looks big, like the Byzantine Empire looks good, big, but, you know, it's just because it's not just an empire, it's actually, you know, it's, there's a bunch of duchies in the, in the empire, and actually, wait, can I, I can access the last one, well, whatever, uh, it's not just duchies, because I can also go down, and there are counties in there, and each county is a count, with a different guy, and in all, each of these court, the guy has a wife, he has children, he has courtiers, and they're all plotting and doing stuff, uh, trying to usually cheat on their partner, but not always. Sometimes they just want to murder them instead. You know, medieval shenanigans. Yeah, so how does that work? Uh, if I go back to my slide, and yes, exit. So, ta -da. Cool, let's go back here. So, this is the profile of CK3. So, as you notice, there is uh, way more green at the top, and well, is black, and a bunch of red because, you know, um, Artifacts of, uh, of basically being a capture. How did that happen? Uh, we changed the model entirely. Well, I didn't, but I, I like to say we as a company, but it wasn't me. Um, instead of paralyzing by uh, entity, we paralyzed by system, which means instead of saying, okay, update every system one by one, and each system hopefully does a parallel fall, just say, no, each system is a task, and we're just gonna queue all the tasks as, as, as if it was a bucket of things to do. Uh, and also, the main thing we did is that we split the uh, the update part uh, between the, the bits that needs to do uh, that needs to read the game state and the bits that need to write the game state. And very quickly, we uh, a rule was instituted that says, "Hey, 
most of the thing you do, you don't have to actually make the data changes immediately. You can just stash the changes. For example, if you want to figure out like uh, if, if the AI is trying to decide which character is going to murder, what's taking time is not murdering the guy because that's just a thing that you just start a murder plot and then it's going to play over a, like a million tech simulation. What's hard is figuring out which one of the guy you want to murder because there's a lot of them. You have many options. But that doesn't actually change anything. The only thing you're doing is you're evaluating for every man in the world which one is the guy I want to murder or marry. You know, can replace all of those. It's, it's that kind of game. Uh, and so what you can do is just say, okay, all those things could be running at the same time. And the only thing they need to do is stash the result somewhere and then we can apply that later. And it was kind of discovered almost by accident because someone realized that uh, the tick system update had a pre and a post update and the pre update pass did not actually lock the game state in read write, it only looked it in read only. And then we noticed, hey, I can do something about that. What if I just, I just put the rule that nothing in this can change anything else. Like you cannot change anything observable and you can write as much stuff as you want in a, in a stash. And then we'll do a post update, which is just apply the results of the stash. Hopefully a mem copy. When it's less likely, for example, we have to run script effect, then it might be a bit more expensive, but that's, that's the world we live in. We, we, we have scripters and they really like to have control over everything. Whereas programmers are like, can we get every simulation bits in the code, please? Because again, I can optimize it. And that's, that's kind of a, it's a clash. So basically we used to do that, right? We have three threads, uh, you update all the countries, you do parallel four, blah, blah, blah. Now we say, okay, we have three threads. One thread will do all the countries. The second one will do all the units. And the football will deal the provinces. That's that's the rough, very rough idea. So, yes. So basically, the the first part and the biggest part of the update potentially only change private data in the game state, something that is not observable by any accessor outside of the system. The system itself, since it's guaranteed to update in its own thread, they can do anything they want in the private data they are reading, but nobody else should be able to observe it by any uh, public accessor whatsoever. And then when you get to the right part, you actually have to apply the values and that's where you try to actually make everything visible. Uh, and you try to keep the most of the update in the first part. The bonuses, you don't have to lock the, you don't block the rendering because the rendering is the same thing as basically any thread that's trying to do computation. It's just reading stuff, it's not writing anything. So as long as you're computing stuff, but not modifying anything visible, we can, we can have the render thread run like 20 times if we need to. It's one of the things before that, we had to finish the update before we can render a new frame because obviously we keep changing stuff all the, all the time. And this one is like render thread, just you can render 10 frames if you want to. If I have to take like 10 milli, like 100 milliseconds to, to process a year, I will, the UI will still be responsive. And maybe if people don't look too much, they'll believe that, you know, the, the, the world is still going on. Hopefully, you don't have to go that far, but if you have to, you can. So, <clears throat> the other thing is that all entities in the system are guaranteed to be updated in a deterministic so, uh, sequential order. Because if you have a thread that says update all the combats, they are still happening one by one, so that keeps the designers happy, because we're still guaranteed that Germany will move first, and then the UK, blah, blah, blah. But why are they doing that? We're also doing that for like every other system because again, you're not looking at anything else. So you still preserve like some uh, deterministic order if you have to because your designs force you to at gunpoint. But you know, like it, 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 comes with, it's, it comes for free basically. Uh, and also it has a big benefit. It's really easy to teach to newcomers because when someone comes as a, as a, as a junior programmer on Hoy and I have to say, hey, make a new system. By the way, think about threads. It has to use cores. Oh my God, you thought about, you, you put the lock, that's gonna be horrible. Oh, you didn't think about that. I was like, ah, and his brain explodes. Here I say, hey, make a new system, create a task for it, and then just do like basically the most like classic, like mono threaded imperative code you want. Only rule is every access to the game state is const, you have to write to this stash and then apply it in the second phase. And that's it, it will automatically be scheduled and it will use whatever core it can find. Uh, so, you know, even if they're not really like super advanced uh, programmers yet and they need to learn a lot about performance and everything, you can still get reasonable results because there'll just be a new task on the, on the scheduler and usually we have already like a bunch of gaps where that new task could run easily. Uh, what did the other two games uh, have done? Uh, that's, that's where I shame them a bit. Uh, CK3 is the one with the most potential and has achieved the best results. 
Uh, Imperator basically kind of was done in the in, in the old style. So even if it has its own session thread, it's just updating everything like we do in 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 in, Europe, in, uh, in Hearts of Iron Four. It's basically the same thing with a bunch of parallel force. Didn't go so well. Uh, Vicky Free tried something very interesting but made a crucial mistake. So they tried to say, okay, an update is basically a task graph, right? So you're gonna update the countries, but the, to update the, uh, I think it actually tried to make very small tasks. Like we're gonna update the population uh, opinion about every party, but for that we need to update their economical circumstances first, and after that we can update uh, what are the polls showing and where are the uh, where are the where are the country politics going. And you know, they create a system where you can declare a bunch of updates, and then you can declare a bunch of uh, of, 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 of pre-requires for those things, and then it would be scheduled and run. But here's the problem. <laughs> they left uh, the multi-threading part for later at first because they wanted to iterate fast. So the scheduler for the longest time was just one thread picking the task after the other. You know what happens when you do that? You don't realize that your, your tasks are actually unable to run in parallel anymore because they start reading from each other because they don't care if they're guaranteed by the scheduler that nobody else will be running. And when you start saying, okay, now I'm gonna do this for more than one core, then nothing works. And they just have to scrap it entirely and say, okay, we basically have a very fancy dynamic graph that is always going to be executed in the same way, and then we hope for God that every of those tests will do a parallel for, because that's the only thing we can do five years into the development. Mistakes were made. So, uh, here's another thing we noticed, is that uh, you can actually combine old school update pattern with the, with the, with, with the, with the new model, it doesn't, it's not a problem, because uh, APIs like TBB or any good like uh, threading APIs that, uh, you know, if you do a parallel for every system update and within that system you do another parallel for, it's not going to spawn more threads. It's just going to schedule more jobs. And if any other thread is done simulating their system, they'll just steal some of your tasks and help you finish faster. So you can just do a parallel for within a parallel for. It's actually absolutely fine. Like most frameworks nowadays, the one we have internally, if you use TBB, it's the same thing. It's going to work perfectly fine. And if you notice, CK3 is pretty good at what it does right now in terms of, uh, of things. So the model is easy enough to teach. The only issue it had, uh, especially uh, when I made this talk, is what nothing was enforced, right? Like you had a tick task and you had like a pre-update function and a post-update function that you had to override to write what the, tech, what the task was doing. But nothing was enforcing the fact at gunpoint that you were not allowed to read and write from every other places because you know we we have a singleton town that is called game state and if you have access to it you can do whatever you want. So what are we uh, what are we going to do for the future or what are we thinking we're going to do in the future? That's the part I updated for this talk today. Uh, so if you look at uh, Hearts of Fire versus Crusader King uh, CPU average usage on VTune, uh, the answer is clear. You should probably try to be more this than this. Uh, I like how this thing is shaming you, like, oh, you know, it's poor. Like, you're using 10 threads, what a peasant. Like, you should be at, at least 13, or I'm not even talking to you. You can actually tweak the things to make you look, look better. I should have done that for the screenshots. But, uh, yeah, like, it's still better. Like, average five, not the best, but still better than, uh, than average, like, one. Um, so the model has uh, proven it quite effective and way more effective than everything else we've done so far, uh, at, at least in production. No big limitation came up um, with a small caveat that I will uh, talk about. And yeah, the main focus since uh, the release has been trying to make it more uh, evident to new programmers. So, for example, a thing that we have done since uh, is that there's a version two of the, like a, an overload of the tic tac system that will by default only give you a cons variable uh, to access the game instead of a non-cons variable, and it will give you like a stash that is read-write and is guaranteed to be local to your task, and then it will call you back for a second callback saying, hey, here is the thing you stashed, and here is an actual read-write access to the game state. Publish whatever you need to publish now, and that's kind of like the type system helps us a bit making sure that if someone tries to uh, do a read-write access during the, a place when you should not, it's gonna, at worst, get an assert, at best, be stopped by the compiler. Uh, so, the idea would be to try to generalize that for the next title, which is one of the things we're looking into. Again, as any studio paradox is experimenting with new things at the same time, we have several things we're experimenting with right now. I can't give any title, obviously, but that also gives me some insights about what we're trying to do. So, one of the things we're trying to do is just 
take what CK3 does, just make it more generalized, use the new API that kind of enforce the pattern, and then try to maybe rename a bunch of interfaces to make it a bit better name because pre-update and post-update is maybe not the best name ever to tell people that pre-update is the cool part and post-update is the bad part. You should just do heavy lifting in the first one. Eh, better naming. Uh, and then you look at potential limitations. So, for example, right now the average utilization of uh, CK is like five, uh, five out of 16 core. Can we do better? Uh, you will notice, for example, if I zoom in on my computer, the 16 cores I think it has, uh, you will notice that like this, this bit is the part where nothing is locked, right? You can just do everything. The, the green bit is the sync, which is where we actually lock the game state. The blue one is the one where we don't. So you, you realize that it tries to do as much as it can without the lock. But still, you'll realize that some things are done way before others. And here's the same thing, right? And if you're really good at reading, you will notice that we have a characters and a characters two system. Uh, it's because the character task used to be basically, because you know, it's a game about characters. Guess what? It was the biggest system, the one that get into the same problem, it's taking most of the time. Luckily, we managed to split it in two, which is very happily named character and character two. Uh, and it uses two cores instead of one, that's a big gain. Especially because it was the bottleneck, obviously. And you can see that all the other systems are done and we're still computing characters. So it still has limitation. Um, as I mentioned, if you can, instead of just uh, having every entity, uh, every system just read its own data, if you can have any entity on the system only read its own data, then you can do a parallel four within a parallel four, right? And uh, and then you can basically transform like queuing an update of your system in queuing an update for every entity in your system and then just fill every gaps you have in your schedule. So for example, let's say that this is our update system, right? We have like three countries to update, five units and eight provinces. Uh, if we just manage to break that down because there is no data dependencies between those items, uh, then we can start like you know shuffling things around uh, and just put them on other threads uh, and you know finish a couple cycles earlier. That's the kind of idea. <clears throat> but wait, did I miss something or what? No, okay, I'm still there. Cool. I'm sorry. I, I did do slides yesterday to uh, to update for the for the presentation, so I'm uh, catching up a bit. So yeah. So basically, the idea would be like try to define which subsystem update requirement you have uh, and. Do, do you need to update all the entities in order or not? And do they need to read each other? Because if you need none of those two, then you can just do a parallel four within a parallel four and, and basically instead of updating your system, you're just updating a bucket of things. And that is really good to spread around less, as many calls as you can get. Uh, so yeah, the futures was trying to double on what CK3 started, make the model more explicit, blah, blah, blah. But all that is old, right? Because I wrote that two years ago. And since then, we have talked about it a bunch internally and tried to think about it. And I would like to take a step back for a minute. So what's in a task, right? So what's an update task? A task that wants to update something, is just, it has a bunch of data inside. That's usually read. Like, you know, you read some stuff, and then you output some stuff. That's, that's basically what a task is, right? So uh, let's say I have a task here, and it's going to read this, going to read this, going to write that. Um, so when can two tasks run at the same time? That's easy, right? If they're both reading data one, they can run at the same time. If any of them is writing, then they can't run at the same time. That's, that's the basic idea. Cool. So if I have three tasks, how can I run them in parallel? Well, again, look at what data they're using. And is there a conflict or not? It's a very easy thing to solve, right? It's just like a very basic, uh, well, actually, I'm bad at logic, but that looks to me like a not and. Um, no, wait, not or, whatever. Uh, so how do I decide that? Well, I can look at all the data dependency. I can do a very, a very simple bitwise operation, and they will immediately tell me, can they run at the same time, yes or no? And if they can, then I can schedule them at the same time. If not, I have to wait until one of them is done, and then I can schedule more stuff. So if I look at those three tasks, for example, that use different data sets, uh, I will notice that uh, data one and uh, task one and task two do not access the same data in write, so uh, they actually can run at the same time. But task number three will actually uh, need to access this one, and this one is writing to it, so I can't do it at the same time. So I have to wait and put it there. Uh, but of course, if, if that's that's if you have the same ties. Uh, if they actually have bigger time, you can you know it makes it usually better scheduled, and you can get some uh, some, some nicer stuff going on. And so, if I go back to what our pre-update thing we're trying to do nowadays, it's basically, what are the inputs? And the inputs is the whole game state, but only in read. 
And what is the output is a private thing in write. And the reason it can run is that basically update countries only has read access to the game state and update units only blah, blah, blah. And they're all accessing a different data structure and that's basically the rule that allows me to, uh, to run that in parallel. So obviously, I could try to generalize that to every task we do in the game. For example, you can say that the UI update and graphics update loop, they will read the game state and write to some render data. And then the renderer, well, it will read the render data. So obviously, those two cannot run at the same time. And those can run at the same time because they're not using the same data. And this one could run at the same time as long as the update task is not running. It's, you can generalize the problem, basically, from what we're doing. So you could technically start scheduling things like that, which is basically what we do, just not in a formal way. It's just more like an accidental way that we figured out along the way, but it's more of a formal model. Someone actually, a new hire we made like three, hours, three years ago, came and looked at us and said, hey, this is basically how formally you could describe this. And with that in mind, we started looking at the idea of turning every update into a series of tasks that describe, instead of describing what system they update, they describe what kind of data they use in read and in write, and what kind of other tasks they depend on. And then you can quite quickly with an algorithm that will tell you, can those two tasks run at the same time or not, and make a scheduler that tries to make that go uh, as optimally as possible, uh, with optimally in, uh, in, in air quotes. So right now what we have in this, what I said before, like all the pre-update tasks are basically, they read all the game states and they write to a private stash. And the update task, which is the post-update part, they read from the private stash and they write to all the game states. So obviously they can't be run in parallel. And the update type, which is the UI update task, it reads all the game state. But maybe we could do better. Maybe we could start going to all the, especially the post update task and say, hey, you're not actually going to change the whole world. I mean, some of them will. If they have to execute scripts, all, all bets are off. Scripts can do anything. So yes, those, those ones were fucked. But anything else, like, for example, if you're just uh, updating stuff from the characters, and then another thing is updating stuff from, like, provinces, potentially they're not going to access the same data structures if your granularity is small enough. And the basic idea is, like, if we manage to break down the data dependencies to a smaller uh, unit, then we can potentially schedule those tasks that before had to run in serial in parallel if they don't use the same data dependencies. Um, and then maybe if we get crazy, we can fit the update and render task into that model rather than make its own dedicated task that, that just runs with its own lock. That's, that's a future concern. That's not the biggest one at the time. But the main idea would be like, maybe we can make a, a schedule that, can, that basically consider both the logical dependencies and the read data pattern that every task declares. The other advantage is you can make that enforced, right? Because if you say my task will take like, for example, the character family data, and we'll write to the character, uh, like, uh, I don't know, like health data, if you manage to make the breakdown, you can make sure that the system says, okay, write me, the only way to make a task for the system is to write a function that takes character data in and, and uh, that takes character family in the structure and, and outputs like character health uh, data out. And you can't access anything else. Like, in that way, what we, we would do is block any access to the game state singleton entirely. Just say, no, if you try to get that, you'll get an assert, you will crash in your face or whatever. You have to, here is a contract, and you can formally guarantee that the task will only read what it, what it promised you to do and write to what it promised you to do, and then the scheduler by construction guarantees that it will only touch that. Um, so... That's, uh, that's the thing we've been thinking about. And again, we have several games in flight, and I think different games will try different things, and then we'll see who wins at the end. So I guess see you in a couple of years to figure out who won. But the rough idea is that I'm still on the fence about this. On one hand, it looks very promising for some things, uh, especially for like the post-update part that right now is just very monotonic. And it would be nice if we could start saying, hey, maybe those post-updates could be done in parallel too. On the other hand, it's harder to teach to people because now they have to, now it's simple, right? You write a system, you can read whatever you want. It's, it's I guess, simpler, because you don't have to have a lot of uh, pre-thought about what is exactly my, 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 my system going to be about. You have access to the whole world. With this model, you have to really think, okay, can I access, um, can I access uh, what exactly do I need to? And then when the scheduler starts screaming at you, hey, you made a task that's basically blocking everything else because it has too many data dependencies. Right now, the only way we have to do it is just look at a graph of like how is the frame process and say, hey, there's this task here. And obviously, due to this input-output and uh, logical relationship, 
it blocks everything else. It's a bit harder to notice. You might not notice it immediately. You might have your tech lead looking at the overnight test and say, hey, you have a problem here. Like this, this, this new thing happens. And then you have to go back to the drawing board and say, maybe I can split some of those data structures in two. Uh, that way, I'm only accessing parts of those entities and other tasks that are reading other parts of the entities can do it. And then you run into the question of how small can you break down your entities to make sure that you have the granularity necessary to have several time, several things running in parallel. It has a lot of potential, but it comes with caveats. And a thing we started realizing very uh, recently is designers don't really like it because designers really don't like constraints. If you ever work with a designer, you know that. And especially in our games, they really like the idea that every system is feeding from every other system because that's cool and organic and blah, 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 blah. So when they come to you and say, wait, can this system actually start feeding from free of a system now? First, it's a hassle in the code because you have to change the declaration of your system, start adding a bunch of like data feeds, and then you have to check in the scheduler, does it actually create a bottleneck in the, in the, in the, in the execution graph or not? And it's, it's a lot of work, and if you want to iterate quickly, and then you realize after the fact that actually it was pointless and you need to remove those data dependencies again and make sure you don't forget about it, it's not as easy as before for better or worse. As a programmer, you would say for better, because that means that designer will stop doing that, uh, especially when they think they can be programmers, uh, and they start saying like, ah, the system, I just realized that I have the pointer to something, so I'm gonna start pulling all the data from a thing. For example, in, a, in EU4, there is an interesting thing that your chance of inheriting uh, a country upon the death of its monarch, uh, if you have a personal union, depends on the age of the Pope. And you're like, why? And the guy was like, I needed some data randomization, and I thought like uh, the age of the Pope is a number I could access through like through like the papacy pointer. So yeah, it depends on the age of the Pope. Every time the the Pope gets uh, changes ages, you have your, your chances of inheriting a country changes. A guy actually managed to figure that out by re 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 reverse engineering the game and figuring out, hey, why are my chances moving? What has changed since the Pope has a different age? My chances has changed. I'm like okay, so there are literally strategies of people trying to kill the Pope to force the game to generate a new pope with a different age to change their, uh, to try to game the system and iterate faster. <laughs> yes. Um, so if you've ever done something like that, I'm actually curious, because this is really like a work in progress thing. We're experimenting with some prototypes. If you've ever tried personally to do some scheduler and maybe move from something way simpler like CK to something more like we have a formal data dependency and task dependency system, did that go well? Did you, what did you run into? I have, my biggest fear is that you're gonna end up with like a, a common like golden thread of, or path of tasks that are all uh, blocking everything else, or at least make the thing harder to schedule. The big thing about CK is that you can read anything, so we don't really, we, there's, there's no like, there's no order dependency, there's only, uh, can you, you can read everything. The only thing you have to drill program in, you have to drill into a designer's head is that basically everybody is, 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 is looking at the data from yesterday, which I don't think is a big deal, especially if you want to factor the realism part of the fact that most people in the medieval age did not know what happened an hour ago uh, in India. Like most of the time, they would not know for years. So saying that they're only looking at the data from yesterday might not be a big stretch. All right, so to wrap up, because I think I'm, yeah, I'm good on time. So if you wanna, if you wanna make a desktop application today that, use, uh, that, 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 that that's gonna be efficient, you're gonna you have to be good at uh, using cores, obviously. Parallel four in your code, if you already have an application going that does not use cores, will help. I mean, it's better than nothing. It can be actually pretty good, but it's only gonna get you so far. If you want to go further, you're going to have to think about a different model, and you're going to have to think about how do I enforce that model, and especially think about new programmers, because we all hire programmers all the time, and we need more programmers to like, you know, make game features, blah, blah, blah. And we can't ask all of them immediately right off the bat to be experts in like how do you spread this workload over, over 20 thread. So if you have a system or a model that kind of helps people do that from the get-go, that's going to be a big help. Oh, and furthermore, I think your build should be destroyed as usual. Thanks. <laughs> All right, so the question is, uh, does the current engine uh, or like um, game like a uh, class just uh, enforce accessing the data? Uh, no, it doesn't. Uh, 
we usually uh, there is a few. No, we don't actually enforce it uh, because due to the way the data system works, there is a chance that you will have a pointer to something that you can always follow. And you know, pointers in C plus plus do not do not propagate const. So even if you have access to a cast country, but the country has a back pointer to whatever, you can follow that pointer and you can yank all the data you want. So no, it's not entirely enforced. For the newer game, we're trying to consider a system. Where I, I, one of the things I have considered, for example, I did not talk about, was keep the same thing with four-bit pointers. Always say you have IDs and you have to go back to a table, and that table will have an assert if I'm in the if I'm in the read-only mode, to just immediately say, "Up, oh, what are you doing?" So, question is, uh, how, how 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 bad of a pain it is uh, right now for people to not notice that we should not be uh, read or writing uh, data from other systems at the same time? It's okay. Uh, we drill that into people, and there is for new systems that they had to CK free right now. Uh, instead of getting like a pointer to the game state, you get uh, you get an actual uh, pointer to your own like uh, system manager, and that's the only thing you're supposed to access. You can still cheat because the game state is a singleton because we kind of assume that there's only one game ring at the time. So if you cheat, you can still grab the singleton and then start going through the, through, through, through the members of it. But I think we, I'm not sure, but I think there's an assert now that if you try to access the non-con singleton, it's gonna scream. But you might still be able to cheese your way through with some casts if you're really evil or just feel like it's gonna help you. But we try to drill that into people's head when they join.